Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, crawling out of your Game of Thrones bubbles tonight <laughs> to come here and listen to some Ruby talks. Uh, I am Ted of House Johansson. Uh, <laughs> But uh, you can find me in most places online as uh, Drenmi. Until recently, I used to work for a Ruby on Rails agency called Tinkerbox. Uh, it's a really awesome place, and they are currently hiring senior developers. So if you want to work for an awesome agency, you can go to the website and drop them a, a message. Uh, currently, I'm working as a contractor with a product company called Engage Rocket. Uh, they are also hiring senior developers, so if you want to work for an awesome product company, you can go to their website and drop them a message. And I'm also on the Rubocop core team. Uh, we are hiring for all positions, and we offer a monthly salary of 10 internet points. <laughs> so if you're interested, you can uh, drop me a message after the, the talk as well. So the title of this talk is Internal Affairs, and basically we're going to look at how you can write uh, your own COP and add it into RuboCop. But before we start, I would like to do a show of hands. Uh, how many of you use RuboCop on a daily basis? All right. How many of you use it for work? Right. So I'm, I'm always interested in uh, hearing ways that people are using Rubocop. Uh, I'm also open to listening to your frustrations if there are some things uh, that are unclear, uh, or offering tips on how to uh, configure Rubocop to fit better into uh, your project. Uh, I realized Rubocop has nearly 16 million downloads on RubyGems, but there are very few resources on how to actually install and configure and use Rubocop effectively. Uh, so my hope is that giving some of these talks will help alleviate that as well. So the goal of this talk is to learn enough about the COP API uh, to be able to implement a custom COP, COP for uh, your own project. But the first question we need to answer is, why would you want to do this? Uh, Rubocop, by default, will help you check uh, for stylistic things. So you can configure it to enforce uh, certain naming of things, uh, certain layouts uh, in terms of indentation, what goes on which lines, and so on, uh, and style-related cops. It also has some performance cops and lint cops. Uh, and cops of all sorts. So these work on a, a very low level to help you maintain a cons consistent style throughout your code base. So that, uh, for example, when you do code reviews, you can focus on the higher level uh, design issues in the pull request rather than having to nitpick about style uh, and ending up in some endless discussions about whether you should use single quotes or double quotes. Recently, however, in Rubocop itself, uh, we added a COP department called Internal Affairs. And this department, you can't use it if you're using Rubocop. You can only use it on Rubocop itself. And this department has some COPs that uh, gives you useful hints about the uh, internal API of Rubocop. If you're using certain methods with uh, certain arguments, it can uh, prompt you to do that in better ways. So essentially this is one level higher than the stylistic uh, inspections where you almost have a sort of a primitive code review while you're writing the code for the things that uh, there are cops for. So we've sort of codified some of the things that we keep commenting on uh, in the pull requests. So if you find yourself commenting all the time uh, to different people, oh, you should use probably use this method instead of that one. Uh, this is the default argument, so you don't need to provide it. Uh, things like that. You can codify that into Rubocop, 
uh, to eliminate it from the code reviews and also give a shorter feedback loop to the people uh, developing the code base. And this talk comes with a, a very big disclaimer, which is that this is not a formalized public API of RuboCop. Uh, so we will be relying on some uh, uh, implicit behavior in the RuboCop code base to put our custom cop into the cop registry. And this comes with uh, some limitations. The biggest one is that you can't add uh, configuration options for your custom cop. This is not the biggest problem because if you're using it in one project, then you probably don't want need the ability to customize it. And if you do, you can uh, probably change it in the code itself. Uh, but it also prevents you from excluding certain directories, for example. So if you only wanted a custom cop that uh, inspected files in the models directory, for example, uh, you won't be able to do that. It will just inspect everything, all the files, which, uh, if you're unfortunate, can lead to a lot of false positives. I am, however, planning to uh, formalize the, this API and make it available to people, partly because I think uh, it's super useful since we started using the internal affairs COPS in RuboCop. Uh, it has really improved the experience for uh, contributors as well, because they can have some confidence before they submit the PR that uh, the code conforms to, to the standards, partly because some COPs are the result of companies doing this. They go and build their own RuboCop COP, and then they come and tell us about it in uh, our GitHub repo, uh, which sometimes leads to us porting that COP into RuboCop core, which is uh, super awesome. So uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the inspection loop in RuboCop. This looks pretty daunting, but we're actually mostly going to focus on point number five. We do, however, need to briefly cover point one to four uh, because it will aid the understanding of what the COP actually does. So the first step when we do any static analysis uh, is to parse Ruby code into an abstract syntax tree, which is an unambiguous representation of the code that you have at hand. And if you don't know what an abstract syntax tree is, uh, just think of it as a tree of nodes, uh, and that is pretty much all you need to know. And RuboCop uses a gem called Parser for this, so it is a hard dependency of RuboCop. Parsers, Parser also comes with some convenience uh, tools, command line tools, that we will be uh, looking at in the talk. The second step, once we have the abstract syntax tree, is to just walk the tree. So we basically iterate over the tree recursively. And for every node, we will um, emit a callback. So we will call a method with a certain name, depending on the type of the node. And this is done by a, a class called the commissioner, the police commissioner, uh, which delegates the work of actually inspecting to the cops. So each cop inspects for one uh, single type of offense only. And finally, the cops are allowed to inspect the code that is emitted. So I'm going to walk through a, a simple example of how this happens. So I'm taking uh, an example uh, active record-ish query where to the user constant, we send the message active, and then we send the message where with a hash as the argument. Now, I'm going to use the command line tool provided by Parser, uh, ruby-parse, to show you the abstract syntax tree that is the result of this, uh, this code. And you can use it with the flag dash e, which means you can pass it an expression directly from the command line. And this allows you to really quickly inspect 
uh, the abstract syntax trees of different snippets of Ruby code. And it's always useful when writing these scopes or working with the uh, abstract syntax tree uh, to have the abstract syntax tree available. So maybe you can copy paste it into a comment in your code or something. So the resulting abstract syntax tree looks like this. It contains a total of seven nodes. You can see that by the fact that there are seven lines. So each line begins with a node. And you can see the nesting by looking at the indentation. So you can see that there's a single root node. And it's a send node. And it is the node that sends the message where. And the first child of the send node is another send node. So that is the receiver, which is the message active. And the receiver of that send node is the constant user. The second child of the outer send node is the method name, which is where. And the last child is the, the arguments, uh, which is a hash that contains a pair where the key is a symbol and the, and the value is a string. <coughs> so if we look a bit at the code itself, the root node ends up being this one. And its first child is this one. And the first child of that one is that one. And then that branch of the tree ends. And the second child of the root node is the hash here, which in turn has one child, which is a pair. And that pair has two children, the key and the value, which is a symbol and a string. So this is a relatively common uh, node pattern. And here is a list of the callbacks that will be called when the commissioner traverses this uh, abstract syntax tree. Uh, it does a depth first uh, traver traversal, so you can basically read it from the top to the bottom. Uh, it emits on send, on send, on const, on hash, on pair, on sim, and on string. And the way we implement the cops for this is we just define the methods on the cop. So say that this cop is interested with uh, method sense, and it's interested with method sense that have blocks. Uh, we might define the methods on send and on block. And the commissioner will automatically pass every single send node in the code that you're inspecting, which is usually your entire code base, uh, to this method. And inside here, you basically decide, do I want to register an offense or do I not want to register an offense? And what we'll be primarily concerned with in this talk is uh, the API for this cop. You can also see that the entire node is passed to the method. And that node actually has access to its children. Uh, so you're actually getting the entire subtree in the abstract syntax tree of the node that you're passing in. So rather quickly, uh, we covered the first four steps. Uh, we parsed the code into an abstract syntax tree using parser. Uh, we traversed it, and we sent a callback for each of the nodes. And now we can focus on the part that uh, this talk is really about, uh, which is how to implement the actual cop itself, how to inspect the, the part of the abstract syntax tree that we end up with inside the cop. So I'm going to, to do some live coding. Uh, the bad news is I recently lost all my stickers in uh, an Apple Care incident. And that's where all my programming mojo was stored. Uh, but I've been uh, praying to the demo gods that uh, I will not have a 
Java updates notification during this demo. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, I can just show you the the Ruby parse uh, interface. So say that we have a single method called foo and we Ruby parse it. Uh, we get some warnings here and those are unavoidable unfortunately. And the actual output is here. So we get a, do I need to make this bigger for you guys? There. Uh, we get a single send node. Uh, it has no receiver, so it gets nil here. Uh, the method name is foo and it doesn't have any arguments, so the node just ends there. Actually, I can keep that up. <coughs> I have set up a, a simple project that we're going to use. Uh, unfortunately, I can't zoom in on the left pane for some reason, but I'll walk you through what the project is. So I have a gem file. My gem file contains uh, Rubocop. And I'm using the master branch, so I hope no one puts any code there that is breaking just now. Uh, and I'm also using RSpec, so we can write some tests for the cop that we're going to implement. Of course, if you use this in your own project, you will have a lot of other stuff here, maybe uh, or a Rails stack or something. Uh, I have the Ruby version, nothing special. I have the .rubocop uh, YAML configuration file. And the only thing I'm doing is in here is I'm requiring my custom cop from the directory where I placed it. And I placed it in a directory called ext and rubocop. And I have a corresponding uh, spec file for the cop as well. Lastly, I have the spec helper. And I would like to point you to uh, a few things here. Uh, the first is that I am requiring Rubocop in the spec helper, uh, which we will need to do. Uh, I'm also requiring the um, rspec support files, which for one will give us this module, Rubocop rspec expect offense. Uh, which, which is a small assertion library that allows us to write very declarative tests for uh, Rubocop cops. And we're going to look at what that looks like in just a minute. Other than that, my project doesn't contain anything. So what we're going to do here is we're going to implement a cop uh, and we are going to call it a deprecation cop and we're going to check for usages of the method foo, and we're going to suggest to the user that they use the method bar instead. So I'm going to start by writing a test for this cop. So I just give it some description. Now I'm going to use the expect offense API. I'm going to pass it a uh, string, and I'm just going to type in the code I want to inspect. In this case, just the method foo. And now what this expect offense method allows me to do is it will allow me to annotate the uh, expectation with the highlight. So I want the cop to highlight the foo uh, method and I can annotate the message. So I want the message to be use bar instead of foo. Okay, so we're gonna try to run our tests. And you can see now we have one failing test which is what we expected, because we haven't implemented anything yet. 
so we expected to have foo annotated with uh, use bar instead of foo, but we just got foo back. This is the actual file where we're going to implement the cop. Now, you need to put the cop in the correct namespace. Uh, the outermost module is called RuboCop, capital C. Uh, the next module is called COP. The third module, you can name it anything you want. This is the department of the COP. So by default, there is the naming department, there is the layout department. And in this case, I added a new department called uh, deprecation. Uh, I added a short description what the cop does, because if I don't, RuboCop will complain about that, and you will, won't be able to see our own uh, complaints. Uh, lastly, I just name the class whatever I want to name it. This will be the name of the cop, and I inherit from the class cop. Now, there's a bit of an uh, unfortunate uh, uh, naming conflict here in that the module where the cops live is called cop, and then there's also a class cop. And this is a bit of a of legacy that we can't really uh, get rid of just yet. The other unfortunate thing about this is just doing this will uh, register your cop into the cop registry. But nowhere are we telling the code to register the cop into the cop registry. So there is some, uh, some implicit uh, things going on here that uh, when you inherit from COP, it somehow adds it into the COP registry, which we should probably stop doing. So if you remember from earlier, we need to listen for some callback. In this case, we are checking for uh, message send. Uh, so we're going to define on send. And we're going to get the send node in as an argument. This method will be called by the commissioner as soon as it traverses a send node, and it will pass us the entire subtree of the abstract syntax tree. In our case, we want to return early unless the method that's being called is foo. Every node that you get into the callback uh, is generally decorated with certain methods, which is where this uh, method method is coming from. And if your editor allows, you can go and check that out inside the gem. So I'm actually in RuboCop source code now, and I can look at the stuff that is available on send nodes. So this is uh, how you can figure out how to interact with the nodes themselves. If we reach all the way here, uh, we're going to add an offense to the node. So now, for every send node that we encounter in any inspected file, uh, We'll check if the method is foo, and if it is, we will add an offense to it. And we'll get another um, error message now, which is good. It's not the same error message as before. Uh, it's telling us we need to add a message to the cop. And I've already written the message in the test file. I'm going to go ahead and take that. And by convention, the message goes inside a constant called msg. And this is one of the things that is almost impossible to know unless uh, you've worked with RuboCop for a while. And this is generally why we uh, want to have the internal affairs cops in the first place. 
So firstly, it will look for a method named message. If it can't find it, it will look for a constant called msg. Uh, and if it doesn't find either, either of them, you will get uh, an error. So we made our test pass, uh, which is a good sign. But our copy is pr uh, quite primitive because it only checks for foo, uh, basically in any context and without arguments. So we're going to gradually change this cop in uh, non-meaningful ways to see how we can uh, make it more specific and introduce some parts of the cop API as we go along. So next, we're going to try to uh, register an offense only when foo is passed to a certain receiver. So this is slightly different, and in this case, we don't want an offense uh, in case we just call with an implicit receiver. So there's another matcher, uh, expect no offenses. And of course, we don't annotate it with messages or highlights because it doesn't have any. So there are a few problems here. Uh, the first test is failing uh, because we didn't expect a message if the receiver is not uh, bus. So we're going to fix that first. Now, one of the downsides of the abstract syntax tree is uh, we don't really know what types of nodes we have. So we generally don't know what methods are available. Uh, so we need to account for a lot of cases. We need to check that there is actually a receiver. We need to check that that receiver is a send type. And uh, this is a bit unfortunate because you will end up with a lot of this. And we're going to look at how we can alleviate that soon. But first, I'm going to check if the test is passing. Uh, so now we only have a single test failure. And it's complaining about the highlights. And I think it's complaining because we are highlighting the wrong part of the node. So the second argument to add offense, uh, you can select which part of the node you want to highlight. So as we saw, the send node has uh, itself, uh, its receiver, and its arguments. Those are the, the, the possible children. And by default, it will highlight everything. So it will highlight the receiver and the, the arguments as well. But we want to be more specific, and we want to highlight only the particular method that is offensive. Now, we want to get rid of this stuff. Uh, because this is pretty fragile, and also, it doesn't read very well. So I'm going to introduce you to uh, an API, which is called node matchers. And 
You can think of them as uh, regular expressions for abstract syntax trees. And we can define one by using the macro def node matcher. And the first argument is the name. Uh, because I don't really know what to name it, I'm just going to name it bus foo question mark. And then it takes a string, because it's a pattern. And I'm going to use the uh, Ruby parse command line tool. To give me the abstract syntax tree. And this is super useful when doing node matchers. You can just copy the output. Uh, make sure you get all of it. And sp mm, spaces make no difference in the node patterns. And now this will define a method for you to which you can pass a node. And if the node matches the pattern, uh, it will return true, or you can yield to a block as well. So we're going to try that. This pattern looks like it's covering everything. It's covering uh, the receiver being uh, bus, and it's covering the method itself being foo. So I'm going to remove all the old code. I'm going to use the new method. And I'm going to use a block. And if nothing went wrong, mm, I used the wrong name. Right, so it looks like our tests are still passing. Uh, so this pattern was equivalent to all that Ruby code that we wrote before. And this is very good, partly because it allows you to declaratively show what kind of abstract syntax tree you're trying to match. Uh, but it's also cool because you can do stuff that you can do in regular expressions, like uh, wildcards and uh, captures. So you can actually capture nodes or parts of nodes, and you can wildcard them as well. Uh, which we're going to look at now. Because we're going to make our cop even more complicated. We want to catch all the cases uh, where foo is sent to bus, regardless of what bus is sent to. So for example, if I send that to a constant, I still want there to be uh, a Rubicop offense on this part. So now uh, our tests are failing again. It did not register an offense there. It did nothing. And if we look at our node pattern, the offender is here. This is the receiver of the bus method. And now, right now we're explicitly saying it should be nil, that the it should be sent to nothing. So we're going to use a wildcard, uh, underscore, Underscore stands for any node, but there has to be one. And that made our test pass again. Now, we're not entirely there yet, uh, because we also want to match in the case where we're passing arguments to foo.
and let's check our tests. We have a test failing test case again, uh, which sees shows that our COP is not taking into account uh, calls to foo that have arguments. So we need to use a wildcard again, uh, but we can't use underscore here. Because if we use underscore, uh, it will fail another test. And that is because underscore matches something always. So then it stops matching foo without argument. Uh, so we need to use another uh, wildcard, which is the ellipses, uh, which matches zero or any number of uh, parts. And that makes the test with the arguments pass as well. So we're going to look at one final thing in the COP API, uh, which is one of the coolest features of RuboCop, if you ask me, which is the ability to automatically correct code that is producing an offense. Now, this is not always possible, uh, but in a surprising amount of scenarios, it's possible. And it looks like in our scenario, we just want to replace one method call with another. So it should definitely be possible. Uh, so we're going to start with writing a test for that. It auto-corrects foo to bar. Unfortunately, we don't have the nice declarative uh, API for auto-corrects yet. Uh, so we need to put in some manual work. I think this is the method name we're going to see soon. So we put in some uh, offensive code. And after autocorrecting, we assert that it equals the code that we want it to be instead, which is bar. And assuming I got the method names right, we should have a failing autocorrect test. So it, we expected to get uh, bus.bar after autocorrecting, uh, but we're getting bus.foo, which is the original code. And this makes sense because we have not uh, implemented any autocorrect yet. The way you implement autocorrect is you define a method, not surprisingly named autocorrect, autocorrect will be passed a node by the commissioner. So what node is being passed to autocorrect? Well, it's, it's not necessarily the node that was sent to the original callback. Uh, it is the node that you register the offense on. And this is a, a common source of confusion, I think. Um, but it's actually really useful because you get only the part of the syntax tree that is producing an offense. So in our case, it will be the part of the syntax tree that uh, is the foo method call. Uh, the way you implement autocorrect is you have the method return a lambda. This lambda will be called and it will be passed a, a special object called the corrector. The corrector has a bunch of methods like replace. And here is the part that is uh, not always uh, nice to work with. Uh, 
you see this uh, lock keyword here? Uh, this is actually some source maps coming from the parser gem. Unfortunately, these source maps are extremely sparse. Uh, and I think the maintainer is not, uh, he's not adding any more source maps or adding any more locations onto the source maps. Uh, but basically, it allows you to target ranges of code inside the, the abstract syntax tree. So if you wanted to target a particular parentheses or a particular mm, method name, a particular quotation mark, uh, you can do that, but you might need to work around it a bit using this uh, lock source maps. And they're available in the parser documentation. For a method send, uh, selector, as we saw when we used it as the site of the offense, is the actual method name. So in our case, we want to replace the selector with the me actual method we want, which is bar. And now we have a cop that is auto-correcting our code for us. So if we recap and have a high-level look at this cop, this is pretty much the anatomy of any cop in RuboCop. Uh, you have the message. You have the callback, or multiple callbacks in the case of uh, a lot of the RuboCop cops. You will add an offense to something if it's considered offensive. You can have the node matchers that will help you uh, match things in the abstract syntax tree. And usually you will have an autocorrect method. And if you go into the actual RuboCop source code and you look at the cops, uh, you won't find many other things except this. Uh, that said, most of the cops have a lot of private methods to help them uh, work with the abstract syntax tree or construct really useful uh, messages. So one thing we didn't cover here was uh, you can uh, match things in your node matcher and extract them and uh, format your message to give a very dynamic uh, offense message to the user. So it's easier for them to figure out what they need to do, uh, especially in the case where there's no autocorrect for the cop. So one uh, neat side effect of this is now that you all know how to, to implement a RuboCop cop, uh, <laughs> you can, if you want, also come and help out in the uh, RuboCop uh, GitHub repository. Uh, we're always in need of more help, uh, not only uh, programmers. If you're interested in uh, improving the documentation, writing gu guides how to use RuboCop, how to develop RuboCop, um, improve the messages for the offenses, uh, then that's also super helpful. So if you're interested in contributing, uh, you can come and see me after the talk, or you can always ping me in uh, the Ruby SG Slack chat. Uh, so that was everything for, for the talk. Uh, if you have uh, questions, we can take them now. Due to time, we have uh, time time constraints. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah, Peter. So one thing that happens when you when you get start getting pulled into the rabbit hole is uh, that there there's actually an extended community um, around Parser, around Rubicop, and a bunch of other static analysis tools and you inevitably get pulled into these projects as well because you need to patch something that is not working that your project is depending on or uh, actually this expect offense uh, thing comes from uh, the maintainer of RuboCop RSpec so he created it for his own project and then we ported it in uh, but there is really a lot you can do with static analysis uh, that said 
there are some very severe limitations. I'm going a bit on a bit of a tangent, but I should mention this. Uh, there is a very severe limitation in that you're trying to statically analyze a dynamic language, which means you can never uh, safely assume what is going to be inside a variable. And because Ruby has things like duck typing, you can't even look at the methods being sent to that thing and assume that it is uh, of a certain type. Uh, yeah, sorry for not answering your question directly. Uh, I think what happened to me is I started contributing to a lot of uh, the same kinds of projects. Very very detailed talk, such as for example, you cannot have like, two consecutive blank spaces in many lines. So how does uh, Ruby Pop this? Uh, as a, how how does Ruby Pop work? That's a great question. Uh, there is another method that is not a uh, uh, callback that is sent on each node. There is one called investigate that is sent on each file, and it will pass the undigested source, and then we can do some more primitive checks, like, oh, how many spaces did you use? Are there tabs in here? Is there trailing space in any of the lines? Yeah. Good question. With that, um, thank you, Ted. Thank you. <laughs> Our next speaker is Dragosh.